Uh, welcome everyone to the QTech 360 seminar. Uh, today, Delph David Elkos. Um, David Elkos is an expert in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, he made many important contributions to quantum technology by working on key topics such as quantum key distribution and the quantum Shannon theory. Uh, for his work, he was recognized amongst others with the UPM dissertation prize. And then in 2015, he moved to Delft uh, where yesterday I actually learned he, he, he learned to speak Dutch fluently. Uh, but also he became part of the team that performed the first uh, loophole free bell experiment. And so since 2017, he is an assistant professor at the TU Delft. And today he will present about theory tools for designing quantum networks. Uh, David, I can hear you, I can see the screen. So if you want to start, the floor is yours. Excellent. So thank you, Meno. Thank you, Gracia, for organizing this. Also, thanks for the kind words, including my Dutch skills. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's a, a great pleasure to be here today and to tell you a little bit about the uh, research in my group in, in connection to the uh, quantum internet division here at QTEC. So I have broken the presentation into two main parts. So first I want to share you, with you this vision of the, of the quantum internet, uh, what we expect it to do, where we sit today. Perhaps this will be very well uh, known for some of you, uh, but uh, not for all of you. And uh, second, as we move towards the deployment of quantum networks, we are going to need tools to evaluate their performance. So in the second and main part of the, of the seminar, we'll introduce recent advances in, in this domain that uh, hopefully will guide the, the design and deployment of uh, near-term quantum network uh, experiments. Okay, so I would like to start with this vision of the quantum internet. So the, the future, future <laughs> quantum internet will be a global network where the nodes will be uh, fully fledged uh, quantum computers that will be linked via quantum channels. And such a network will, uh, will allow, will enable the transmission of quantum information between any two points on earth. So why would one want to work towards uh, such a extremely challenging goal? So the reason is that uh, such a network would be very useful. Quantum communication links enable the implementation of uh, many communication tasks that are just not possible with, with classical resources. Um, maybe the, the, the most famous task is quantum key distribution. And maybe you also learned a lot about quantum key distribution in the presentation earlier today by Nicolas Anguar. So uh, using quantum communications, we can distribute keys uh, between two distant parties. And these keys will be secure even in the presence of, uh, of a computationally unbounded if store. For the purpose of this talk, this is uh, more than, than sufficient. And key distribution is, uh, is the most famous example of a communication task where quantum uh, give benefits, but uh, that there are uh, many more. So what this means is that exchanging quantum uh, bits is very useful. And this is, of course, a, a great reason towards, uh, to work towards uh, this vision of, uh, of a global quantum network. But at the same time, the quantum internet is something that will not happen tomorrow or um, even in, in the next five years. So to have something more touchable, more more tangible, together with Stephanie and Ronald, we thought of some intermediate milestones that could need to be achieved in terms of uh, the functionality that the quantum network delivers to the end node. And the main message of the, of the article is captured by the figure in the screen, where we list the stages of quantum network development as we expect them in terms of time. So the idea of this taxonomy is that once you add functionality to the network, new applications uh, become possible. So at the bottom of this list, we have uh, trusted repeater networks. These are networks of individual quantum links that are then connected classically. So in a sense, these uh, trusted uh, repeater networks are not fully quantum because there's no quantum information traveling end to end in, in the network. Um, then once we connect end-to-end uh, -end points in, in the network with quantum links, then uh, we can, uh, for instance, uh, distribute secure keys. This is what we call the prepare and, and measure states. And once we're able to distribute entanglement very far and with high fi uh, fidelity, then we can do uh, something called a device-independent uh, key distribution, which was the, the topic of this earlier presentation from uh, Nicolas Anguard. 
if we add memory capabilities to the network nodes, then we can also do a little bit of, of computation and we can think of applications like uh, blind, uh, blind quantum compu computing in, in the cloud where um, you can send the quantum data to, to a remote quantum computing server and then the, the server can run the algorithm that you want on, on the data and one can show that the server does not learn anything about the data or about the outcome or about the algorithm uh, itself. So one uh, states above, uh, once the nodes in the network can perform operations below the threshold for fault tolerance, then one can, for instance, use the network to implement a distributed quantum computer. I will say a little bit about this uh, towards the end of the, of the presentation. And finally, at the very top, we have a quantum computer sitting on, at each of the nodes and we can implement some uh, very sophisticated communication tasks. For instance, one can think of sending fingerprints of a, of a quantum state. Uh, to check whether or not uh, two remote parties hold uh, the same state. Okay, so now I will make a quick overview of where we are today in terms of experimental demonstrations of networks and, and links. So what is the state of the art for point-to-point -point quantum communications? This depends a lot on the transmission medium. If we think of uh, free space, then the state of the art is shaped by a series of, uh, of experiments that uh, have been performed by the PAN group. And perhaps the uh, most remarkable result was um, a demonstration of quantum key distribution based on post-selected entanglement uh, between two parties that were separated by more than uh, uh, 1,100 kilometers. Now, if we change our focus, if we think of uh, fiber optical communications, then it is even possible to purchase equipment from a handful of vendors for, for doing quantum key distribution. And this equipment will allow to distribute keys over a distance of um, say 100 or 200 kilometers. Uh, with uh, state-of-the-art lab equipment, we can go further. The most recent record is something like uh, 800 kilometers. This is from, from earlier uh, uh, this year, from January two, uh, 2022. But it's not going to be possible to distribute keys by direct transmission over much longer distances because of the fundamental losses in fiber, which unfortunately scale exponentially with, with distance. So how do we move up, not only in terms of distance, but in, in terms of uh, functionality towards the, the upper level of, um, of this taxonomy that I presented? So for this, we will need so-called repeaters that can extend quantum links. And the functioning of repeaters um, for many proposals at least build directly on the distribution of long-lived entanglement. And today there are several hardware platforms that have been able to, to make entanglement between separated nodes. Um, this long-lived entanglement was first achieved by, by the group of Chris Monroe with trapped ions already 15 years ago. And since then, since then, many other hardware platforms have, have achieved this uh, in, in depth, notably with uh, NV centers in, in Diamond. And building on, on this uh, technology, recently the group of uh, Ronald Hanson demonstrated a, a first quantum memory network uh, in the lab. Uh, three nodes were jointly entangled, and the entanglement was leveraged to create a, a GZ state, which is a resource for, for many protocols and also to generate entanglement between Alice and Charlie, the, the two nodes that were not directly uh, connected. So now let me switch a little bit uh, focus and I would like to, to make a, maybe an obvious observation. So any approach for scaling a quantum computer is likely going to be modular. So for reasons such as uh, cooling power or, or crosstalk, there's always a limit to the number of qubits that a given technology can place in, in a single monolithic uh, device. There's a question. So at some point for any technology, it is necessary to interconnect uh, different devices, creating then a, a modular architecture. And this uh, necessarily modular architecture is what uh, Jerry Cho recently called the, the quantum intranet in the context of scaling uh, superconducting quantum computers at, at IBM. Let me give also two other concrete examples. So in the bottom left, what we have is the uh, concept uh, music architecture from Monroe. 
where um, individual uh, multi-qubit uh, registers are coupled to, to photonic quantum channels and then through some uh, reconfigurable um, optical cross-connect uh, suites and the appropriate uh, measurements and qubits between different registers can be entangled. And uh, these switches could, of course, be stacked in, in some uh, hierarchical fashion, and uh, this would allow to, to scale to, to very large uh, qubit numbers. On the, on the bottom right, there's a, a mapping of the surface coding to, into a square lattice uh, modular architecture, which could be implemented, for instance, with ion traps or, or defects in, in diamond. This proposal is from uh, Nickerson from 2013. And, um, it's obvious that uh, th these modular architectures are local area quantum networks, and the challenges to make these architectures uh, successful are somewhat similar to those realizing uh, to those of, of realizing quantum networks at, at the higher stages. So this brings me to to the end of of this first introduction part today. Um, we are already designing the, the very first quantum networks. And uh, as the scientists and engineers designing the, the networks, we face many, many questions. If we fix a uh, setup and, and a communication task, uh, task, you can think of uh, key distribution. We will want to know, does this setup allow me to perform my desired communication task at all? Can I, in this example, distribute secure, uh, secure keys? If the setup allows to, to distribute secure keys in principle, then I will want to know uh, quantitative answers. At what rate can I distribute uh, keys? And of course, the problem, in fact, is much more complicated, right? That typically, the setup will not be fixed. We will be able to choose among uh, different types of technologies. And there's always some flexibility in, in perhaps the, the number of nodes and their placement. And what we really will want to do is to optimize over this space of uh, possibilities. Uh, with a quantitative answer. Well, what is the best uh, configuration? And uh, these questions can be addressed from very different lenses. And if, depending on the, on the lens, one gets uh, different types of answers. So in the following, I'm going to address these questions uh, from three very different lenses. First, I'm going to look through the lens of uh, information theory. I will consider the mathematical model of a communication channel and ask, uh, what is the fundamental limit for performing a communication task? Second, I will consider um, abstract uh, simplified models of, of quantum networks, capturing um, a small number of uh, relevant uh, physical parameters and analyzing these models can give us insights into uh, the feasibility of practical protocols. And finally, I will discuss how to deal with uh, detailed models when one wants to predict um, what's going to happen with a, a concrete uh, uh, setup. Okay. So um, now I will present these uh, fundamental models of quantum networks and, and discuss some recent advances on the valuation of, of their performance. So this is the most technical part of the presentation. Please bear with me. I will walk you through the, through the formulas and, and summarize the, the take home messages. So let me start by considering a single communication link and removing uh, the quantum component. So in this figure, you see um, uh, the generic description of a scheme for sending classical information through some uh, noisy channel N. What is a noisy channel? For information theory, a noisy channel is just a stochastic map. And the most simple example is, is the map that takes uh, zeros uh, and ones and flips them with some probability p. This is called the binary symmetric channel. In this example, uh, I want to send a k-bit message. And for this, I'm going to encode the k-bits into little uh, n inputs uh, into, my, into my noisy channel. Um, and then I set the, the encoded message through n uses of the, of the noisy channel, this big n. And they are going to arrive to, to the decoder. And the task of the decoder is to output a guess of the input message M. So this guess will be wrong with some probability epsilon. And in, in this abstract example, I have achieved a, a rate of k over n bits per channel use with error epsilon. 
So the fundamental question in information theory is to find the maximum rate measured in bits per channel use at which epsilon, the error, can be made arbitrarily small. This is called the capacity of the channel. Why do we care about capacity? So we care about capacity because we believe that it captures the usefulness of a channel in an absolute way. So let me investigate some mathematical properties of a capacity and how these properties relate to, to this usefulness that we would like to capture with a capacity. So suppose that we have two channels, channel N and, and channel T. So I can define the capacity of uh, the joint channel of using n and t, and I denoted by c, by the capacity of n tensor t. So I say that a capacity is additive if for all channels n and t, the joint capacity is equal to the sum of the individual capacities and super additive otherwise. OK, why does additivity matter? So for this, let me define the contextual capacity of n given t. And this is the difference between the joint capacity and the capacity of t. So this contextual capacity captures the added value of um, n when we send information jointly with channel t. If a capacity is additive, the usefulness of n does not depend on the context, while if a capacity is superadditive, then usefulness will, will depend on, on the context. OK. So a second property of capacity that we might, might care about is convexity. On the left, we have a situation where we can choose between channel N and channel T with some probability P. And on the right, we have that we don't know which channel we are, we are using. The only thing that we know is that uh, uh, channel N and channel T are chosen with probability P and one minus P. So a reasonable capacity quantity would be convex. We prefer to know which channels we are using beforehand, right? But if there exists a channel for which the right is larger than the left, then we say that uh, this capacity is non-convex. OK. And the third and final property that we care about is uh, complexity. Ideally, we would have an efficient way of computing capacity. So it turns out that the classical capacity of a noisy classical channel, these uh, stochastic maps, is additive, is convex, and can be computed efficient. Now, if we move to the quantum case, the situation is much more complicated. First of all, the usefulness depends on the task. There are different capacities depending, for instance, on whether we want to transmit classical information or we want to do quantum key distribution. This is called the private capacity or to transmit quantum information. This is called the quantum capacity. And uh, second, we know that the, the private and, and quantum capacities are neither additive nor convex. Their usefulness depends on the context. And uh, regarding complexity, the, the situation is as bad as that we don't even know whether these capacities are computable. And in fact, there are some partial evidence in the direction of uncomputability. All right, so I have spent the past five minutes uh, I guess, showing you the strange mathematical properties of quantum channels and how little we know about what usefulness means in the, in the quantum world. Now, I want to give you the opposite message. For a subset of channels, including some of very um, much practical interest, we do know quite a bit. In order to argue this, let me uh, now represent a channel by a blue wire. And this is going to simplify the, the figures of, of networks in, in a couple of slides. And now let me introduce yet one more um, information theoretic concept. One can define the capacity for a task in the presence of different res resources. For instance, one common assumption is that classical communication is a free resource. So in a, in a world where any quantum information processing is uh, qualitatively, uh, say, more expensive, this is uh, somewhat reasonable. But um, yeah, I guess whether this is fair or not is going to depend a lot on, on, the, on the scenario. So in the following, I will be technically speaking about the private capacity when two parties can also use a public classical communication for free. And this, uh, this quantity is denoted by, by P and uh, a super, uh, this superscript with a, with a double R. So what do we know of, uh, about this quantity? So we can prove that it is upper bounded by some entangle, entanglement measures uh, uh, of the channel. And luckily for, for channels modeling communication in fiber, th these bounds can be proven to be tight. That is, we, we know exactly the capacity of, of these channels. This is a, a relatively recent development. So th this was uh, finally shown 
uh, by Pirandola et al. In, in 2015. So you might wonder how, how these capacities that are a, a very abstract concept are useful in practice. And it turns out that having this uh, fundamental uh, benchmark is, uh, benchmarks is, is rather useful. So I'm going to give you one example. So the community did not completely agree on what devices we can call quantum repeaters and which devices we, we should not call quantum repeaters. And capacities allow to benchmark in a very unique way repeater implementations and give a yes, no answer. And the, the argument is, is as follows. So consider a link, a quantum link, separating Alice and Bob. And let's up, uh, assume that the, the private capacity of, uh, of this channel is K. And now let's suppose that Alice and Bob uh, don't like K. They want to do better. And they play some, uh, some uh, device uh, between, between them. And then they now use their devices to implement a quantum key distribution protocol and say that they, uh, they managed to achieve some rate of uh, secret bits per, per channel use, R. So if R is strictly larger than K, then I would argue that uh, this can be fairly called a repeater because it allows to achieve a rate that is fundamentally impossible in the, in the absence of the, of the device. Now let's extend the model of a channel to a quantum network. We can model a quantum network by, by a graph and um, um, each of the links, uh, at, at each of the links that there's a quantum channel and the nodes are quantum information processing devices. And again, we can define a private capacity for, uh, for this network, and we can define it as the maximum over all rates uh, measured in bits per channel use for which one, we, we can communicate faithfully, and two, we can keep a potential eavesdropper uh, ignorant. This can be um, rigorously uh, formulated. All right, so given how difficult it is to compute or even to bound the capacity of a quantum channel, I guess it was not clear a priori how difficult it would be to the, the same task for, for quantum networks. And it turns out that for networks composed of fiber optical channels and for many scenarios, we have um, efficient methods for bounding or even for computing the capacity. Let me first sketch how to obtain upper bounds. The, the idea is very simple and is borrow it's borrowed from, from classical flow theory. So let's suppose that Alice wants to trans transmit quantum information to Bob through a network and consider a naive scheme where Alice uses each channel in the network um, only once. So actually we don't need to know anything more to bound how well the scheme can do. For this, we, we can divide the nodes of the network in two groups. In two groups. One includes Alice and uh, one includes Bob. And we call the first set Alice prime and the second Bob prime. Uh, so in graph theory, this is called a cut of the graph. Now, if Alice prime wants to communicate with Bob prime, she will need to do it through, through the channels that are connecting the two sets. And this is an easier problem for her uh, than um, using all the channels, right? As she's just now using the channels con connecting um, Alice prime and, and Bob prime. And the optimal rate for this problem cannot be smaller than the rate for the than the optimal rate for the original problem. So the technical insight is that we can bound the capacity uh, of the set of channels connecting Alice prime with Bob prime by the sum of the entanglement upper bounds of the individual channels. And this is true for all possible divisions into Alice prime and Bob prime and Bob prime for all the possible cuts in the network. So the best upper bound that we get with this argument is the minimum over all cuts uh, of the sum of the capacities of the channels uh, in the cut. And second, we can use the channels with uh, different frequencies. And the, the same argument still holds for all choices of frequencies. So in order to get an, an upper bound on the capacity of the network, we need, we need to maximize over all possible choices of channel frequencies. And finally, it turns out that this optimization problem is, is a linear pro, uh, program, right? So this is efficient to solve. So let me summarize. Given the entanglement measures of the channels in the network, we can efficiently find an upper bound on the, on the network capacity. And it turns out that similar to the individual channels, this upper bound is tight for, for the channel typically used to model fiber optical uh, communications. Um, Okay, yeah, I, I went a little bit ahead of myself. So <laughs> this is the, the recap. All 
maybe let, let me add that. Um, so in quantum networks, we are not only interested in point-to-point -point, um, uh, communications between a pair of users, we, we are interested in more complex uh, setups where we have multiple pairs of users or we have uh, multiple users that they want to do something together. And the same tools that I just described turn out to be useful for computing or bounding efficiently uh, many of the, of the associated capacities. If you're interested, you can take a look at the, at the reference uh, below. Okay, so fundamental models of quantum networks and, and their associated capacities, they give us fundamental bounds on the achievable rates. But, well, they tell us nothing about how um, an individual scheme with imperfect devices is going to perform. So now I move to the second lens for analyzing performance abstract models. And I call abstract models the models that capture a relevant number of physical parameters, but are not too detailed such that it is possible to characterize performance in, a, in an analytical way. So let me give you two examples of these models. And uh, in a moment, I will make a bit more precise about the, the general class of processes for which we can uh, still make strong statements about performance. Okay. So for instance, we can simplistically model entanglement generation um, uh, between two nodes as a probabilistic process. With priority P, uh, the process produces some fixed density matrix um, um, raw, and uh, with priority one minus P, it fails and, and it heralds some failure flag. Um, now on the right, if we have that a node manages to, to distribute entanglement with two adjacent nodes, uh, node B, um, this would be not being in, 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 in the right figure, then this not be can uh, measure locally the, the two parts of the entangled pairs it holds and induce entanglement between the two adjacent nodes, right? This is uh, entanglement swapping. So entanglement swapping is also a process that we could model uh, probabilistically and we could say with priority P is going to succeed and with priority one minus P, it is going to fail. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, early on in the presentation, direct transmission is, is strongly limited, fundamentally limiting distance. So if we want to transmit quantum information over long distances, then we need to, to use intermediate uh, repeater stations. And the simplest configuration is a, a linear network, which is also known as a repeater chain. So let me consider a chain of quantum repeaters that builds on these two blocks, generation and then swapping. Uh, in this example, the chain is composed of, of four links and, and five nodes. And this uh, example proceeds in a hierarchical fashion. So the, the um, nodes uh, attempt to generate entanglement with some probability uh, Pn. And then when two adjacent links uh, generate uh, entanglement, then they attempt uh, to, to swap the entanglement. And this again is going to succeed with some probability uh, P swap. If swapping fails, then um, one needs to, to start again from, from scratch, right? And we proceed in this way until at some point we, we succeed. So now let me pose a seemingly simple question. How long do the end links need to wait in average until an entangled pair is produced? I'm not asking yet anything about the quality of the states, just about the time that it takes to produce them. So, it turns out that this innocent question is extremely difficult to answer exactly, at least for, for what we know today. So the best known algorithm uh, has an exponential running time in the, in the number of nodes in the chain. And this is because the algorithm maps the different configurations of the repeated chain um, to states of a, of a Markov chain. And the number of possible configurations is basically exponential in the, in the length of the chain. So there exist also some analytical expressions, uh, so, sorry, some analytical approximations, but these analytical approximations, they can be of, um, for instance, uh, by a factor of five for chains with uh, 16 segments and can be of uh, by a factor of, um, of 20 for, for longer uh, chains of say 2000 segments. And finally, I wanted to, to introduce some uh, efficient um, iterative algorithm that we proposed um, a couple of years ago. And this algorithm gives an, an approximate answer also, but the, the approximate in, in uh, the quality of the approximation in this case can be, can be controlled. Okay, 
So this algorithm uh, works with protocols that are composed of unit protocols, or um, we call them uh, blocks. And these blocks need to have uh, some properties. They, they need to have uh, uh, a stochastic uh, map that it describes uh, success or, or failure, uh, a map for producing the, the output state, um, this rule could uh, include arbitrary models of, of the coherence and then um, a map for the time that it takes to execute the, the protocol. So what kind of blocks uh, we have? Um, we have come up with four interesting examples. So there is uh, gen and swap, entanglement generation and entanglement swapping that I described a moment ago. And we can also consider distillation and the cutoffs on the, on the waiting time. So the main message is that for some truncation uh, time uh, t, then the running time uh, for each block is order t square log t. Uh, and depending on, on the symmetry of the protocol that we are considering, the, the number of blocks is at most uh, uh, linear in the length of the, of the chain. So we can have a final complexity at most n times a t square log t, right? So this is uh, uh, tractable for very long uh, repeated chains. So the example that I have here is um, the translation into blocks of the, of the swap only protocol that I presented a couple of, of slides um, uh, ago. And um, yeah, so we can write the protocol in this compact form by adding the appropriate, uh, the appropriate blocks. And the figure on the right depicts the, the distribution of the waiting time and the fidelity, right? The, the Markov, uh, um, uh, chain protocol that uh, I described um, earlier only can predict the waiting time. Now we can also uh, predict the, the fidelity. So here we have blue that corresponds with uh, uh, raw uh, generation. It has uh, uh, constant fidelity and some geometric distribution of the waiting time, or it corresponds with the distribution after the first swap, and green at, at the very end of the protocol. This is just an, an example. Okay, so, so let me recap. So I presented um, abstract models of quantum networks. I introduced a general algorithm that allows to estimate the, the performance of a large class of uh, repeater protocols. And uh, I mean, by itself, uh, uh, it's interesting, but we can also use these tools, for instance, for optimizing uh, quantum key distribution over repeater chains. And that's something that uh, we, have also, we have also done. Okay. So in the past section, I introduced abstract models. Uh, they capture some part of the physics of, of repeater chains. They are useful for, for gauging the, the value of a scheme, but they don't carry a predictive value. If we want to predict the behavior of a quantum network, then we need detailed models um, that allows us to capture exactly how the, the devices perform and, and the corresponding noise processes, for instance. So motivated by this, um, already five years ago, we began to, to develop NetScript, the network simulator for quantum information with discrete events. And we identified three main requirements. So we wanted uh, accurate timekeeping that will allow us to, to accurately predict the amount of noise and, um, and also to model asynchronous protocols. Uh, this was one. Two, we wanted to track um, large, large networks of potentially thousands of nodes. And three, we also wanted to be able to build new protocols, to simulate new protocols and new networks and new devices by reusing what we have, by stacking um, a smaller protocols or a smaller networks. And in this way, hopefully we would be able to derive uh, hardware requirements, to design protocols uh, at different levels of, of abstraction, um, uh, analyze feasibility of, of applications. This is the, the anatomy of the NetScript simulator as of uh, its uh, 1.0 public release uh, last year. So the core of the package is a discrete event simulation engine. This allows us to define time dependencies and condition on time depends. I'll, I'll give a, a small example of how this works in the, in the next slide. And it also has a, a modular component library and this allows us to easily define the new hardware pieces or, or new protocols. Okay, so let's take a look at the core of this um, NetSuite, which is this uh, discrete uh, event simulation. And also let me mention, this is exactly the same uh, paradigm that, uh, that is fueling uh, most of the classical network simulators. 
So let's suppose that we want to simulate a, a teleportation experiment. So we could have um, maybe some um, intermediate node Charlie is going to generate an entangled pair, and this would correspond with a, a start event for our discrete event simulator. Then the, the simulator would initialize the corresponding events, and it would schedule two events in the future corresponding to, to the arrival of the qubits to Alice and Bob. Then the simulator moves to the next uh, event, which is the qubit arrival at uh, Alice's node. And the event is handled by Alice's node, and it will perform some joint measurement with a state of uh, Alice that she wants to teleport. And then Alice will send the outcome of the measurements to Bob, and this corresponds again to the scheduling of uh, one more event. Then the clock moves to, to Bob's reception of the qubit. Uh, then it moves again to receive the, the corrections. Bob applies the corrections and, and, the, and the simulation. Okay. So let me give you a couple of samples of what we can do with, with uh, uh, NetSuite. So as a first use case showcasing the power of NetSuite, we, we studied recently um, some uh, uh, quantum suites that had uh, been introduced in the, in the literature and we were able to uh, study beyond the region for which uh, analytical results had been obtained so far. So this, um, this switch is, is a node which is directly connected to, to K users by some optical link. And the communication task is distributing uh, bell pairs and, and n partite GH set states between some subset of, of the users. So the switch achieves this by, by connecting uh, bell pairs, which are, connect, uh, which are generated at, at random inter intervals on, on its link. And um, so I guess these switches can be uh, regarded intuitively as a generalization of a simple repeater performing entanglement swapping with uh, some added logic to, to choose which parties uh, to, to link. So even with a streamlined physical model, this is very challenging to analyze um, uh, analytically, but with NetSquid, this was a few lines of, of modeling code. And on the right, we have uh, um, we, we studied NV centers uh, and we asked the questions, when do repeaters do more good than, than harm when they become useful as a function of some hardware uh, parameters? Okay, so let me recap. So um, yeah, we want to, to resort to detailed models when, when we need predictive power, right? Um, and to deal with uh, detailed models, we wanted a quantum network simulator that uh, satisfied the um, modeling uh, accurate physics and, and accurate uh, time, that it was scalable, that it was uh, modular. Um, yeah, and uh, these simulators can be used for the examples that, uh, that uh, I made and for many other things. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it here. I want to, to stay we still say a few words about um, uh, distributed quantum computation. So the point I want to make is that these tools that I have uh, presented will also play a role in the design of architectures for distributed quantum computation. So for this, I need to, to quickly remind you of the surface code. So the, the surface code is defined on a 2D lattice of, of qubits. In this, in this picture, uh, the qubits are on the, on the edges of the lattice. The code space is a simultaneous eigenstate of all the stabilizers of the code. And in the case of the surface code, the stabilizers come in, in two forms. They are placket stabilizers, which are associated with, um, with all the qubits in, in the face, uh, in a face of the lattice, and star stabilizers that are associated with each vertex you know, in, the last, in the lattice. And then in order to detect errors, what we need to do is to measure the stabilizers of the code periodically. When we see an outcome that changes value between successive measurements, this indicates some type of, of errors, right? And if the number of errors is, is small, then we can identify them and, and, and correct them. So why do we like this of this code? We like it for, for two main reasons. The first reason, I guess, is that uh, the code is very robust against noise. And the second reason is that stabilizers can be measured locally in the lattice in the sense that they only uh, involve uh, uh, neighbors in, 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 this, in these two D lattice. So more concretely, to measure each stabilizer, we can use uh, this circuit that I have on the, on the bottom right. And what we can do is to add an ancilla qubit for each stabilizer and to, to measure um, 
the, the stabilizer to measure the parity, we apply a two qubit gate between the ancilla qubit and each of the qubits involved in the stabilizer. Okay. So enough introduction. Now let's imagine that we place each data qubit on a different quantum device. Then if we want to implement a, a surface code, we still need to measure the stabilizers. But now, of course, we, we can measure the stabilizers using a, a shared uh, ancilla qubit. And it turns out that we can uh, use entanglement in order to measure the stabilizers. In particular, we can use a GHZ state to, to measure the stabilizers. And these GHZ states then plays the, the role of, say, a, a distributed ancilla qubit. So we need to distribute one qubit of the GHZ state to each of the nodes that are involved in the, in the stabilizer, and then do a, a two qubit gate between the qubit uh, in the code and the qubit uh, of, the, of the GHZ state. Then we measure the GHZ state and we find uh, the stabilizer measurement outcome by multiplying the value of each of the individual measurement outcomes. So this process that I, I just described gives us a, a simple recipe for, for implementing a modular surface code. We have that each model consists of one or, or more qubits from the code called the data qubits and uh, one or more ancilla qubits that are used to generate the, the GHZ states. And then we can proceed basically analogously to the standard surface code consuming GHZ states to, to measure the, the stabilizers. So you can see that the GHZ state is going to play a very important role in the distributed surface code. So how do we generate the, the GHZ state? So this can be done in, in many ways. One way is to take bell pairs as the starting point and then combine them to create a GHZ state. So the simplest way to, to do this is what uh, in this figure, is, this figure is called the plane protocol. We can uh, generate uh, probabilistically entanglement between two adjacent nodes. Um, and then by, by doing the appropriate uh, measurements at each node, we can uh, fuse the bell pairs and create a, a GHZ state. But of course, if the fidelity of the bell pairs is not uh, high enough to start with, then the fidelity of the GHZ state is also not going to be high, and the surface code is not going to perform well. So in order to improve the fidelity, we can bring more bell pairs into, into the GHZ uh, creation protocol, and we can uh, do some, something analogous to uh, bipartite state uh, distillation in order to have better GHZ states. For instance, uh, the protocol in the right is, is called modicom, and it uses instead of three, four bell pairs. And of course, one can think that um, the more the merrier, right? The more bell pairs you have, the better, but there are some uh, non-trivial trade-offs that are involved here. So if one uses more bell pairs, then the protocol takes more time. And this means that the data qubits will experience uh, more decoherence. So the, the point that I want to make is that the same tools that I have presented uh, earlier can be slightly modified to study, study these kind of problems. And this is something that we are currently uh, that we are currently doing. Okay, so this is in a, in a nutshell what I wanted to, to tell today. Let me recap. So at the beginning of the presentation, I discussed how at this very moment, uh, the first quantum networks are being designed. And the design of quantum networks is going to require tools that tell us um, the performance of, of a quantum network. Um, the, the answer is going to, to, present, to depend a lot on, on the model of the network. And I presented different ways of modeling quantum networks and discussed some of the tools for predicting performance and what are their uh, pros and cons. So I began with the fundamental models of quantum networks. Um, uh, for this uh, channel and network capacity are the, the most natural measures of, of performance. And I introduced some tools that allows us to efficiently compute non-trivial bounds on quantum network capacities via some linear programs. Then, um, well, I argued that uh, fundamental models, um, well, give us some fundamental bounds, but they tell us nothing about how individual schemes uh, perform. And then I defined abstract models. And for some large family of, of um, repeater chains, uh, we can also uh, analyze efficiently for instance, what's the, the waiting time and, and fidelity. And finally, um, well, I said, okay, well, abstract models um, allow us to evaluate roughly how useful is, is a network, they carry no predictive value. So if we want to predict the behavior of quantum networks, then, uh, well, I presented this paradigm of discrete, uh, discrete event uh, simulation, I introduced uh, NetSquid and I 
gave a couple of examples about how, how it can be used. Okay. So I have tried to present a coherent picture with some concrete answers to, to different scenarios. But I also believe that uh, these are, say, the first uh, baby steps towards uh, quantum network science and um, tools that uh, allow to predict performance. So I, I, there will be many more tools, I guess, uh, uh, coming in the following years. So yeah, uh, if you want to work on these topics, please get uh, in touch with me. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you, David. Very nice. Um, let's see if there are questions. I see still a lot of applauding hands. Um, either raise your hand or be bold and just unmute yourself. Um, let me maybe start, uh, David. So I was wondering about this, this um, using networks for quantum computation. You make quite some statements about this. I, I think it will be unavoidable in the end if we scale that, that we will use networks for uh, as a solution for a quantum computer. So I, I guess the real question is actually, what will be the size of the individual modules and what will be the requirements of the links rather than if this will be the approach? So could you comment on what you would think, like to what extent will we scale these individual modules and, and what will be the requirement of those links? Will they you know, just couple to the edges of a module or, or, or how will that work in, in your vision? So I guess this is going to be very technology dependent, right? Uh, so there's this uh, um, NV approach where one has a, a single data qubit uh, per node and then uh, um, basically links are everywhere. And one could also think of having uh, this uh, huge uh, monolithic devices say uh, with, uh, I don't know, 1000 or, or uh, even more qubits. Uh, um, and one links the, the different um, the different chips. At the, at the same time, you, you mean how, what would be the connectivity of the network? I see it difficult that one is going to be able to couple directly all with all, right? So, so there will need to be some uh, small number of links and one will need to come up with uh, nice ways of uh, moving the qubits that need to be linked uh, to to the place where one can uh, can communicate this will be a, this will open a nice theory problems by, by itself uh, how to move the qubits in a smart way to the communication part and thanks and maybe to continue on that question so uh, you also spoke a lot about simulators something i'm wondering here is so if if these simulators then can simulate networks that you could potentially use for computation, you may wonder what's the difference then with a simulator that's just used for computation. And, and I think you know, several of them exist. So could you highlight you know, the, the key strength and difference between them? That's, that's a very, very good question. So the thing with, with networks is that one really wants to capture uh, timing. This is a key, for instance, if one wants to estimate what's happening with the distribution, say, of a GH set state that one later is going to, to use. And uh, um, so the coherence depends on time, right? So being able to exactly capture what's the average time that it takes, what happens uh, at one moment or, or another. So if you want to simulate an asynchronous protocol, then you need to have this um, uh, discrete event uh, simulator. In the same way that for a classical computation, maybe you can just program it, but if you want to uh, simulate what's happening on a classical network, you still would use some, some simulator like the one that I have uh, presented. So it's the network part and the synchronicity of events that, uh, that require this kind of uh, approach. I, I could or maybe let, let me maybe, put it uh, in another way. So if you have a distributed computation and you move up enough in, in abstraction such that uh, uh, you are just doing operations on, on some um, um, effective quantum computer, maybe you don't need a, a this, uh, um, this kind of simulator. But uh, if you are more to, towards the bottom where this uh, uh, asynchronous event take place and you want to exactly characterize them perhaps to, to be able to apply or to understand what kind of noise process uh, is going to affect one qubit or the other, then, then you need this uh, discrete event simulator. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so I think if I understand what you're saying is that if you want to simulate a certain algorithm, then of course you can uh, program that. But if you really want to model how the system behaves, uh, there's many things to take into account and, and those requirements are different for networks. I must apologize, my, my headphones went off for 20 seconds. Can you repeat your comment? Uh... Well, then, then trust me, my answer is right because I see there's also <laughs> questions. <laughs> and we can otherwise continue later on. Um, okay. Tumia Luka, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, I do. So one thing I was wondering is that um, I heard that the quantum network is they currently have plans to have a quantum network between the multiple Dutch cities. And I was wondering, like, how are you going to set up the optical fiber between those locations? Are you going to build something, just dig a hole? Or are you going to reuse existing infrastructure like the KPN fiber network? Like, what are the plans in regards to that? I'm afraid I'm not there. Right person to, to answer to, to this question. Oh, okay. Oh, oh thank yeah, you. So, but maybe what I can say is that one can reuse uh, existing fiber optical infrastructure, what's called as dark fiber, right? There's a, a lot of uh, fiber, optical fiber that's deployed and not used. And this can be reused for, for sending quantum information. Maybe this partially, so uh, that there, there won't be any uh, digging um, to deploy new new fiber. Okay. But uh, about the concrete details of uh, um, how the, the network is going to look like, uh, then yeah, I prefer not to comment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's see, are there other questions? And maybe another one, uh, I was wondering, so in your finals, or no, this is the final slide, the one but final slide, that image, is this just uh, linking some random places or? Uh, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's a artistic uh, depiction. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Sorry, yeah, yeah, one needs to be very careful with these images. There's no meaning beyond the global quantum internet. Uh, intended. Very good. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, then let's thank David again for the great presentation. And thanks everyone for attending and let's see you at the next uh, QTEC 360 seminar.